gold trails and ghost towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and with me is Bill Barley, our resident expert in things to do with treasure and gold and silver for places from the Yukon through British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest. When we had our last program, we talked about Yale, the gateway, I guess, to the interior of the province of British Columbia, but we go through the gates and inland today. Yeah, we go up the big canyon, go past Lytton, up the Fraser, turn east on the old Quesnel River. And then we go to the forks of the Quesnel. Very fascinating area, Mike. Would this be in the late 50s, 1850s? 1859. That's the time. And, and there's treasure associated with this country, too? Absolutely intriguing treasure story I've traced for about 18 years. Quesnel Forks, is that the same as Quesnel today? No, entirely different. There was Quesnel Mouth, which is Quesnel today, and the forks of the Quesnel, or Quesnel Forks, which is upriver at the division of the forks, the south and north fork. Okay, we're going to take a look at that country, have some remarkable treasure stories, talk about the Chinese and gold a little bit today, right after we take this break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley en route to Quesnel Forks, but I guess we should get a good jumping off spot. Yale would be the jumping off spot today. Yeah, Yale's a natural, Mike. This is, this is the metropolis of the interior. It was the, the jumping off spot to the caribou, to the gold fields, and it was the big town of the interior of British Columbia. Miners could get here by coming on the stern wheeler, come up by land. They came up by land. Now, it's interesting. Before 1863, they had to go overland. They had to go up through the big canyon, past uh, Jackass Mountain, past the Colonel's Retreat, mm -hmm. until they built the Caribou Road, which was some time later. The Barnard's Express shot here with an eight-horse hitch. This, uh, I guess, the gold rush in the interior made this company. Oh, certainly it did. And by then, the Caribou Road was built. What an engineering feat. This Call, is remarkable. They called it one of the seven wonders of North America, and I actually think it was. They put this road through in several years, over 500 miles long from Yale to the gold fields of the Caribou, actually to Williams Creek, and a lot of this was, was powder and blasting all the way you know. through the, one of the most in difficult terrains in the, in the Pacific Northwest. And you can, you can take a look at the Fraser River and the Fraser Canyon. You can't imagine how they got it through. I know. Cribbing and the cantilevered road over, I mean... Remarkable stuff. Oh, man. But the guys who preceded that, they had to go in across these mountains, Jackass Mountain and the like. That was a rough run. Oh, yeah, very, very difficult. One false step consigned you to sudden death. That's all there was. And this, this is certainly, the, the, you can read this in the old diaries. And you had a lot of individuals, most of them Americans, most of them Californians, uh, who came up the Fraser River, following up the rush in 1858, mm -hmm. 1859. And they came through various small towns, um, such as Lytton and then Lillooet and all these towns along the way. Now, Lytton is a pivotal town, is it not? I mean, it was established about this time. Was it a, was it a gold-based town? Originally, it was called the Forks, and it was, it, its raison d'etre was because of the gold rush. It would never have existed. Established and named after Bulwer, Bulwer Lytton, who was an Bulwer English... Bulwer Lytton? Bulwer Lytton, who was, the, they say, the most... Uh, uh, interesting. He wasn't really interesting. He was very boring, but he was he was a prolific writer. Yeah. And they said that uh, you listen to him for half an hour is like listening to the ordinary man for two or three years. He was <laughs> awful, just <laughs> awful. <laughs> Prospectors had to make a decision when they came to Lytton. There was a lot of direction to go. Yes, that's right. They had to either go up the Thompson. Many of them did. Many of them went went up the Thompson River. They went east on the Thompson. But the bulk of the miners still went up the Fraser, following these this trail of gold on the bars as they went up. And there were Sailor's Bar and Murderer's Bar and Strawberry and all the other bars all the way up the Fraser. And they were following this trail of gold, thinking it would lead them to the mother load. If they went up the Thompson, was it the dross for them there? Nothing? Not exactly. Uh, Dead Man's Bend uh, had, had some gold in it. There was some gold on the Thompson. Beyond that, there was Scotch Creek. And, of course, beyond that, eventually, the Big Bend country. Yeah. But it was definitely it was not the gold they were seeking. Who are, these, who are these prospectors? Run a few names by me. Well, the most fascinating one was a guy called John Rose, who was not generally well-known in the annals of the Pacific Northwest. But he was probably the best plaster prospector in British Columbia. Others were well-known. 
There was uh, Billy Cunningham. There was George Weaver, who was a mine finder from California. Um, there was Siwash McDonald, a Canadian uh, half-breed, actually, from, from the state of Washington, Colville area. Um, Doc Keithley, host of individuals. These are the 1858ers. These are the first ones. These are the, these are the vanguard of the rush. Okay. And they're, of course, searching for this stuff. This shot just kills me. How much does that nugget weigh? Well, I think this nugget weighs, by looking at around three pounds, very close to three pounds, Troy. Uh, this, is, this is large by British, British Columbia standards, not large by world standards, Mike. But uh, it certainly would attract attention. You would never forget it. Never. Quinell Forks, this is the shot. Okay. The miners went up the Fraser River. They turned east. Some of them turned east at Quinell Mouth, following the Trail of Gold, and they went up the river testing each bar as they, as they went, Rose's bar and so on, and they came to the forks of the Quinell, another decision. And some of them went on the South Fork, some stayed right there at the forks of the Quinell and established a settlement, which we see in this photograph. And some went up the North Fork. How many people lived in Quinell Forks in its heyday? Probably in 1859, somewhere around 1,000, but a moving, shifting population all the time. So there were literally dozens and dozens and scores of miners coming upriver and scores going back and so on. Whether they had confidence in the area, this was, of course, very important. Now, when I think of placer mining, I think of sort of the gold pan, but this is a different breed of cat here. Just up from Quinell Forks on the south side of the South Fork, was a very, very famous area. It was called Dancing Bill's Gulch at first, later became known as the Bullion Mine, under, and it was, was taken over by a man called J.B. Hobson, John Beauregard Hobson, who was from California, probably the best hydrauliker in the business. That means they used this type of, and we see it in this photograph here, a water cannon, which is called a monitor or a giant, and uh, it's kind of like a gun, and it, and it shoots out water at a terrific pressure underhead, and it washes down the gravel through a bedrock sluice. And they, the people that would operate that monitor, they would just be like, uh, like a guy operating a cannon. He could direct it anywhere he wanted and tear down that gravel layer. They were artists of the gold fields. I remember talking to old Mr. Murray of, of the Likely area some years ago, and he said they could actually direct that the, uh, a large monitor, the jet from a large monitor, into, into some gravel and carry that gravel under the cushion of water over and drop it at the mouth of the, of the bedrock sluice. These, That's how good they were. Who were. What did they call guys who did that? that they were the work? pipers. Pipers. Yeah. And how much pressure would come out of one of those? So much pressure that if you ever got in the way of it, you were a dead man. It would literally tear you apart. Then the monitors ranged from about one inch up to about 14 inch. So they were, and, and of course the larger monitors, once you get beyond four inch, that was a very, very dangerous and lethal sort of uh, piece of mining equipment. Had to have very, very steady men on it. And it certainly tuck out the country. Oh, yes. The most efficient method of mining. When the guys got the, the gold, I mean, as they directed these tons of gravels into these sluice boxes, yeah. uh, what process did they use to finally capture it from the... What well, was... in a hydraulic mine, you usually use mercury. So they'd have mercury plates and so on, and they would use large, large vats of mercury to, to actually uh, um, pick up the small gold because the mercury has a natural affinity with gold, and so it does pick it up. Now, the ordinary miner had a different method. He was in the field. He couldn't carry very much equipment. He carried a potato and a small vial of mercury. So he'd chop the potato in half, hollow out the center, and then put the mercury in with, the, with his gold pan and all, all the concentrates in the gold pan. The mercury then would pick up all the gold. He would put that pellet of mercury inside the potato, the hollow part, wire the potato together, bake it over a fire, making sure he did not absorb any of the fumes at all because they're debilitating and deadly and can be fatal. And uh, then he would just, uh, after he'd baked this potato, he would reach in and uh, pull out the mercury pellet, gave him an amalgam of gold, which would probably be about 95% pure. Good heavens. Yeah, natural. Potato alchemy. That's right. Had no idea that was the way it worked. Okay, once the, you mentioned the fellow's name already, the fellow Hobson, who was responsible for the whole This is, this is a picture of, of Hobson, a photograph of Hobson, probably by the 1890s. A little elderly here possessed of a very, very fine and inventive mind. He brought my water from miles and miles around to provide the head he needed to operate the bullion pit. Now, when I ask the question, how much bullion? Well, this, this, this is a bullet of bullion. This is 400 troy pounds, which today would be worth very close to $3 million. This is one of his cleanups in one season. Now, 
this is a whole bag more bullion. This yeah. is refined gold that he's sitting in. Yes. That's him right in the middle, right? Yes. This gold would be well over 90% pure. And, of course, they're guarding it pretty well. The two guards in the, uh, in the picture who are surrounding and J.B. Hobson's in the center, uh, they're looking pretty carefully at it. And they're pretty hard-nosed individuals. And people knew that they, uh, first of all, they would have a very difficult time carrying that gold out. But this is probably well over a ton, somewhere between one and two tons of gold in that particular photograph. Just, how, do you have an overall value of what was produced? We don't, well, I'd have to go over all the records, Mike, but I think it, it's, it's uh, suffice to say that, that the, the mine itself, the bullion pit, was one of the deepest hydraulic pits in the world. This is not just British Columbia or the Northwest, one of the deepest in the world. There are only two others that come fairly close, one in California, one in Russia. People are constantly looking for this thing they call the mother load. Why don't you call the bullion pit the mother load? It's the deepest, the biggest. It hauled out tons and tons of the stuff. But the mother load is very close to the original source. So what they're really looking at in the mother load is the, is the quartz stringers or the quartz veins that the original gold was derived from. In other words, they were cut away by water action and then they eventually distributed this gold down the creeks and down the streams. That's what they're looking for, the original source, which would be hard rock, Mike. Have they who's found the mother load. Obviously, the gold in Johannesburg must be a mother load. Where's the mother load in B.C.? Well, the mother load in the Caribou is right close to Barkerville itself, right near the old town of, Way uh, of Wells. And this is, uh, this is pretty well established that it came from, you know, Cow Mountain and, uh, and Mosquito Creek and, and Island Mountain and so on. So all through that area. There's a lot of daughters around, though. We've still, we, apparently, there's still some of Quinell Forks left today. There is some of Quinell Forks left. One of the classic ghost towns, and this shows a, a picture of Quinell Forks, very close to what it looks like today. This, was, this, this photograph was taken in the 70s, and you're going through the old Chinese section just beyond 2nd Street and down near Nason Avenue. And these buildings were the buildings of commerce of that day. That's right, and this is old McRae's general store. John McRae was a very famous merchant, probably the most famous merchant in Quinell Forks. This building, unfortunately, no longer exists. You recommend the saving or the preservation of this town and what's left of it. Oh, definitely. One of the classic towns. It's very important historically. One of the early gold towns of British Columbia would not take much to save it. Should be saved. Okay. We've got a few little treasures here. Um, this, the bottle-finding era was very popular in the 60s and 70s, it seemed to That's me. That's right. A lot of people headed out there. These bottles represent what? Tell me about this one. Well, they're here. typical of the bottles. Those were found in Quinell Forks by old uh, Mr. and Mrs. Nielsen, Mrs. Winifred Nielsen and Herman Nielsen, who lived in Quinell Forks for about, oh, 40 or 50 years. So they were up there a long time. Enterprise Brewing Company of San Francisco for the brown sure. one here. Yeah. And this bottle, this is just a beauty. What... Uh, how do you describe this is Kil Kitterland? Kitterland, yes. That's a Dutch, that's a Dutch bottle, and that's, uh, that's a three-mold. And it's, it's really typical of the, of the bottles that came out of Quinell Forks. It's, uh, there were thousands, literally thousands of bottles came out of Quinell Forks. And that's, you call that desert glass? Yes, it's desert glass. Because of? Because it's discolored slightly. It's, it's got that, that, that just that slightly opaque velvet son of This was one of the first marketing tools to build a bottle that you could not put down. <laughs> Had to finish it. What, what did you call this, this shape? What is that? That's a torpedo type. And what would come in it? Well, probably soda in that particular bottle. And uh, what would be the function of having a bottle that you couldn't put down? Did it carry better this way or... I don't really know, Mike, but I know this, that they didn't, they didn't break too easily. So, oh, I know. You know, I mean, you, you could probably drop that on cement, and it would still be, I wouldn't advise it, but it would probably still survive the, the impact. Right. The treasure story that is fascinating, talked a little about the mother load. The bullion yeah. pit had to be an attractive uh, piece of wealth, but the Chinese enter the picture at this time. Tell me about the Chinese treasure. Well, the China, Chinese treasure is very, very interesting. And you must realize, you must study the character of the Chinese themselves. And this is one of the original Chinese in the area. This is Lim Singh. And he was a son of Ah Tom, who was called China Tom. And uh, he owned a store in Quinell Forks. And he was one of the individuals who knew of the existence of the so-called lost Chinese mine. And there's, it's been rumored for years. And I never got the hard facts until a few months ago, actually. All right, we're going to take a break here, but we'll come back in just a second to find out about this treasure, and uh, we'll do that right after these words. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley. And we're talking about a lost Chinese mine worth millions. Probably worth millions. We don't know how much is left, Mike, but certainly they took, it's hard to tell, but probably several hundred pounds of very, very coarse gold out of this mine. Now, the Chinese, of course, were miners, followed the gold throughout British Columbia, and there were many Chinese miners in Quinell Forks. Hundreds of Chinese miners in and around Quinell Forks, working places like Murderer's Gulch, Kangaroo Gulch, Big Wheel Flat, and so on. This, the gold we see in these pans is the kind of gold they were hauling out. This is the kind of gold they were getting from the lost mine, not the kind of gold they're getting from right around, directly around Quinell Forks. Now, that, that picture we just looked at was from the Cedar Creek mine, yeah. and that was 1921. And this was another mine that they had missed in the 1860s, was fi finally found by two, two trappers, Platt and Line, in 1921. And we think there's a relationship between the Cedar Creek run and the lost mine. It occurs in similar kind of ground, that kind of thing? Probably very close to the same altitude. I am, th this, this is the, the documentation we have and the evidence we have, which in some areas is rather sketchy, Mike. I cannot ever conceive of a lost mine, given the number of men crawling this country with all the expertise and the fever. Tell me how this mine became the lost mine. Okay, in 1800, by 1860, and 1861, certainly 1862, the white miners had passed on upriver, up the North Fork, up the Caribou River, onto Keithley Creek, over to Cunningham, over to Antler, and eventually into the Caribou proper. That is Lightning Creek and Williams Creek and Nelson and Slough and all these famous historic creeks of the past. And the Chinese lagged in the rush, so they stayed around Quinell Forks and mined, and eventually their mine, their diggings began to be depleted. So a few of the Chinese set out to prospect the immediate area. And two Chinese in 1864 crossed over at Four Mile, crossed over the North Fork of the river, and went up past Kangaroo Gulch and disappeared into the hills. They returned a few days later, loaded down with pokes, leather pokes of gold, and it was coarse lead gold like the, like the gold we'd seen in the picture. Now this indicates the area they were going into. So we see Quinell Forks were looking north, yep. and somewhere in those hills back there, <laughs> according to the Chinese, according to Ah Tip, and according to Ah Tom, and, and all the other Chinese individuals who are concerned with this mine, it was about nine or ten miles from Quinell Forks, probably what they called half-dry digging, so they would use a rocker there rather than sluice, so it probably was a high ancient channel. And how long did these Chinese miners utilize the, this... Uh Mother, this load here, this wonderful richness. It was so rich, they mined 1864, 65, 66, and 67. By that date, they had achieved multi-millionaire status in China. They decided to go back to Canton. They took their gold with them, went back to Canton, ready to retire in absolute luxury like medieval princes. The living was so riotous and so high for the older Chinese, he died. And the younger Chinese stayed there right till 1871 lived like a prince, was not too worried, felt that if he ran out of money, and he wasn't well schooled in that, that he could come back to Quinell Forks, rework his old mine. He did run out of money in 1871, came back across, had enough money for a fare across the sea, and went, went to Victoria, over to, over to Yale, up the Fraser River, up past Quinell Mouth, and right to Quinell Forks, back where he came from, but the country had changed. In 1869, a devastating forest fire, which you can follow in the old newspapers like the British Commons, swept that whole country, destroyed all the landmarks he had used, including probably some very, very cleverly marked trees that he, they were no longer there. They'd been yeah. burned. Eighteen Chinese, had been, eighteen prospectors had been killed in this fire. He went back, still convinced that he could find his lost mine, and looked for the remainder of his days north of Quinell Forks, north of Four Mile and somewhere north of Kangaroo Gulch. Never did find it. But the individuals who knew him and knew the story, other Chinese, were convinced that the mine existed. They had seen the gold, they knew the two old miners, and they knew that the mine existed. So therefore, they spent up to 70 years looking for the Seven mine. Seven zero years. Seven zero, from 1871 right till the 1950s until the last Chinese disappeared from Quinell Forks. Men like Ah Tip looked every year. Some white men like Shorty LaHaye looked every year. Ah Tom knew of his existence. Lim Singh knew of its existence. All the Chinese knew of it, the existence of this mine, and they were not prone to chase after lost mines that, mm -hmm. were, that were, simply did not exist. They knew it existed, 
No one had found it. No one has found it to this day. And you point to the 1921 find on Cedar Creek, which was a, which was a tremendously rich mine. That's right. In similar kind of country, another deposit of gold could exist right this very minute. Quite minute. easily. They missed Cedar Creek, but they, and they found it, but they didn't find the lost Chinese mine. The scales, and with some of the artifacts from your collection we have in front of us right now, these scales, these Chinese scales, were used to weigh the very gold that these people were finding. That's these scales weighed that gold. These scales belonged to Ah Tom, and then it belonged to Lim Singh, and then it belonged to the Nielsens who, who sold them to me. And they are unique in that they are bank scales. There was an old Chinese bank in Quinell. And when the Chinese came in and weighed their gold, they weighed them on this type of scales. These are wonderful, wonderful weights. These are not like, uh, what do you call the penny weights? Penny weights are... or troy weight. No, they aren't. This is the Chinese, the Chinese weighting system. And this shows what we call the catty weights. And they were familiar with this system. So the Chinese would come in and weigh their gold on this scales with old Ah Tom or China Tom. This weight right here. What would it weigh? It, it doesn't weigh exactly what other people, but to have this much gold in your hands gives you a funny tingle in the pit of your stomach. Especially when you realize that several millions of dollars were weighed on this particular scale. Oh, sorry, I was picking up a second one and a third one. There were 11 weights in the set and there were probably 12 because the Chinese usually had numbers divisible by four. Yeah. Remarkable. What a fine. This is a piece of of history and a piece of art, they're sitting on top of a uh, a little occasional table that weighs about what, 250 pounds? 250, 275 pounds, and it's, uh, it's an express safe. Came over into Quinell Forks in the 1860s. Came overland actually, and came into Ah Tom's original store. So the gold was transferred from these weights and and this scales into the drawer, and eventually at night from the drawer into the safe, which was locked with a very clever locking system. All right, I have a key in my hand here. This key has got four different clefts to it, but only one of them works. At a certain angle. At a certain angle. And it doesn't open clockwise. That's right. It opens counterclockwise. counterclockwise. And they're inside it. And the safe itself, of course, has the Wells Fargo colors. This is an original Wells Fargo safe. Wells Fargo was in British Columbia, Mike. And this was an original Wells Fargo safe with the, with the forest green coloring on it. And somebody repainted it again. Now, these silver dollars, what's the story behind the well, silver Well, when we purchased the safe, there were a lot of gold coins in it. And when we actually packed the safe on the truck to bring it back into the collection, a number of gold coins fell out. And, uh, and so this, this was used as a, as a storage place or as actually a safe or a bank for the Chinese in Quinell Forks. When we, you mention some of the names of the people, these people actually exist. You've mentioned all sorts of names, but one of the ones was Ah Tom. And you have here China Ah Tom. That's right. He was known as China Tom or Ah Tom. So they wanted to make sure he was called China Tom, and he was the guy who knew of the existence of the mine, along with all the other Chinese in Quinell Forks. It's still there. It's still there. That's our gold trail in Ghost Town for today. We'll see you next week.